Before we get into this video, there's something I forgot to mention while recording it originally, and that is that this is the last video before the midterm. So if you are studying for the midterm, this is the last one that you need to watch for the sake of that. Everything after this will be on the final. Anyways, let's get into the video. In the previous video, we started and learned a little bit about input and output files. In this video, let's take a closer look at some more examples of input and output files, specifically where we don't know the structure of the file. So in the last video, we had a file where it contained a name of a person, an age, and an address. So we had some sort of knowledge of exactly what the file is going to be like. However, that's not always the case. Take, for example, here where we're going to have a list of names. So in this program, we're going to have a list of names, and we're simply going to read in those names and then write them out to the console. And so here I've created a list of just generic names, and we want to be able to read these. Now consider that I might have some amount of names and it might not always be consistent. So here I have four, but it's totally possible that my file might contain five or six names or a hundred names or even just one name. And so if I have some sort of uncertainty, then we're going to need to be able to handle that in some way. And if you are remembering one of the previous lectures uh, where we handle things that need to be repeated in some way, then you're probably thinking that we should be using a while loop, and you would be right. And so here, let's go ahead and try to learn how to handle that. Now, first things first, I've gone ahead and just coded pretty much all the stuff that we had in the last part for the sake of brevity. I do some error checking, and then I open the file. And what I want to address first before we get to the actual reading part is we want to make sure that the file opened correctly and so I want to go over one way to do that in C++ is to simply after you've opened the file you can take the file and check good and what good it checks is if the file opened correctly so here what I maybe want to do is if it's not good so I'm going to put a not which is the exclamation point in front of it and so what this says is if the file was not good so if the file was not good, didn't open, or it was corrupted or something like that, then we want to exit. And so this could happen for a few different reasons. It could happen if the file simply doesn't exist. It could happen if the file is open by another program and doesn't have access to it within our program. It could happen if the file just didn't open and was corrupted, although that's usually going to happen over the course of the read rather than when you actually try to open it, unless it's the actual file system itself that's corrupted. And so there are a few issues that might happen here. It may also happen if it's being transferred or if it's missing or something like that. Anyways, if we get a file that is not good, so we put the not in front of the good here, let's just print an error message. So see out, and then we'll put could not open file. And we'll put the name of the file here just for the sake of it. So I'm going to put argv1 and line, and we will return a 1 as a sign that we had an error. And I'll put a return 0 down here at the end. OK, so that's just a general way. There are probably multiple. I have these arrows going the wrong way. That's my bad. There are probably a bunch of different ways to do this in C++. This is the way that I have always been familiar with. And you can check this in other languages before you even open the file, which is nice. But in C++, it does seem like you need to open it first before you actually check that it opened correctly. Anyways, we know that the file is open now. We need to do some reading. We have a list of names where we don't necessarily know how long the list of names is. And so we said we're going to need to do some sort of loop because the loops go as long as needed. They can keep repeating actions. And so we want to go basically until we can't read anymore. And so what we're going to do here, and again, there are a bunch of different ways to do this, is we will get line. So uh, remember that we said in last video, while, um, while we're reading strings that have spaces in them and we want to be able to read them, we're going to have to use get line rather than the normal insertion operator because we need to read the spaces. So here that's applicable because there's a space between Will and Wedgwood here, so I need to be able to, for all of these names, be able to, uh, to get that space. So I'm going to have to get line. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get line, and then I am going to get from the input file, which we call list file here, and I'm going to read it into a string variable. Now, for the sake of my program, I do recommend you make any sort of variables that you want for the loop outside of the loop, because it's kind of inefficient to put it on the inside, but there are some cases where you may want to do that, specifically if you need something to do with pointers, which we won't talk about in this class. Um, so I would say try to leave it on the outside. So what we're going to do is try to read that. Now we need to have uh, something here that will specifically handle the issue of when we're not at the end of the file. So one way we could possibly do that is with listfile.eof and that should be with parentheses and what EOF stands for is end of file. So actually I need a not in front of this and what end of file does is it will only return true if you're at the end of the file. So what this says when I put the exclamation point with the not in front of it, it says while we're not at the end of the file, do the code that's on the inside. And so, well, if we're not at the end of file, we should probably do some reading. So here, what we have so far simply says, while we're not at the end of file, let's read the next line. Okay, and we will simply just print out the name. Here, let's just count with it as well. Let's just say I create a variable called i, and I'll say int i equals zero, and I will simply say c out, and then I will print i, and then let's just say a dot and a space, oops, space on that side, and then end line, uh, or not an end line, then the name that we just read, and then the end line. So it's pretty simple, and this should go through the whole file, and while it's not at the end of the file, it will read the next line. So this will, presumably, uh, I'm saying that knowing that there's going to be something wrong, uh, this will presumably, at least if we're thinking about it right, grab the first name, read that, print it, grab the second name, print that, read it, um, grab the third name, uh, read it, print it, and then do the same with the fourth name. And so uh, get line right goes one line at a time. So it'll grab this line, then that line, then that line, then that line, and it will print it. Let's see what it does. Okay, so now we're on the school server. I'm going to simply g++ and then name my file is readnames.cpp. I'll do that. And then we remember that it was dot slash a dot out and then the name of the file that we want to read from, which is here called listofnames.txt. And so I do that and ah, uh, there is an issue. Two issues, in fact, I forgot to count, but that's not what I meant to be the issue. The issue here is that we get this weird space at the end, and this has to do with the way file pointers work. Okay, so here, for the sake of the example, I've created an example file called example file, and it contains three strings in it. And what we said in the last video is that whenever you open a file, the file pointer, which is just the thing that kind of is like the blinking line in a text editor, it's going to start at the beginning of the file. So as far as when it begins reading things, it starts at the very beginning, and it's going to read left to right as it reads. So here, when I do something like get line, it's going to get the end of the line. And our code looks something like this, where it said while not in file dot end of file, then keep reading. So here we have that. And I would then, whenever it gets a line, it would simply go from the beginning here, and then it would go to the end of the line. So uh, the first get line would do this, and then it would check, well, are we at the end of the file? No, we're not at the end of file. And so we'll go to the next line, and then are we end of the file? No, and then we're not. And so you would think at this point, I'm at the end of the file, right? If I did three get lines in a row where I read string zero, string one, string two, I'm at the end of the file. That's actually not the way it works, and it, it seems a little counterintuitive, but if I explain how end of file works, hopefully it will make more sense. So the way end of file works is it is only triggered when a read fails. So if we consider what just happened in our program, it read string zero, it read string one, and then it read string two. 
And so it's done those three reads so far. It did this one, this one, and then that one, and now the file pointer is here. And so if it does the next read, it's not going to be able to do anything successfully. And the reason that is is because there's just nothing left in the file for it to read. But um, it does not actually mean that it's at the end of the file yet. So end of file is only triggered when a read fails which is probably not the way that you would expect it to work, but it does make sense if we think about uh, the fact that it can't really like look ahead in the file, right? So even though we just read string two, as far as the file knows, there still could be stuff beyond that. It really can't know until it looks ahead at the next thing. And so here, uh, when it's on this, this like imaginary line and just floating in space here over there, it doesn't know that there's nothing over there yet, and it can't know until you try to do a read. And so there is some stuff that we can do to try and make this work, and we will check that over in our code. Okay, so we're over in our code now. First things first, let me add the I++ that I forgot to put. Let's actually count. And so we're going to need to edit our code a little bit. The way I'm going to do this is something that you should definitely remember, so keep this in your mind, especially if you're going to be doing some future programming, because this is the way that you should do reading in C++. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a single read before we get into the while loop, and then I'm going to do a read at the end. And so let's just explain exactly what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I'm reading the first line, and so the reason I do that is for two reasons actually. The first reason is because I've moved the other get line to the end, which I'll explain why I did that in a second. And the other reason I've done this is in case we encounter a file that has nothing in it. So consider that a list of names can contain any number of names. So it can contain one name or four names or five names, but it's equally valid for it to contain zero names. That is still technically a valid list of names, it's just a list of no names. And so if I have something that's zero names, and aka just an empty file, if I get line before the while happens, what will happen is we said end of file is triggered when a read fails. And if we have an empty file with nothing in it, the read is going to fail immediately because there's nothing inside of it. And so what will happen is it will get the line, it will fail, and then the while loop just never happens because there's nothing to do. And so that handles that. The other reason I said is because of the fact that we had to move this to the end. And uh, the reason that is, is because we're waiting for this to happen here at the end. And so if I wanted to print the name, so here I, I have it print the name on this line. If I didn't have a get line before my while loop started, then name would just be random garbage. Because if this line was gone, if I comment this out, then name isn't set to anything, at least for my first loop, right? I haven't set it to some blank string, and as far as the compiler knows, that's just it's meaningless. There's nothing that that name contains, and it may generate an error if you even try to compile this, and if it does compile, it will probably just spit out some garbage or give you a core dump or something strange like that. So make sure that you're setting the variable. Here I'm making sure to read a name, assuming that there's the first name in the file before I print it. Now to justify why I moved the get line to the end. And so the reason I do this is we are now printing before we get the line. Um, previously, we were getting line and then printing, which is, I think, the common sense way to do things, right? If I gave you a list of names like we had in our example, then you would probably think, oh, I'll grab it first and then I'll print it and I think that makes perfect sense but we actually kind of need to turn around our thinking if we're trying to trigger end of file which only happens if a read fails then we are going to need to do a read before we do the check of end file and so that's why I've rooted to the end here what this will do is it will read the first line print it and then try to get the next line before we try to print anything. So if we consider what this will do here, is it will read the first line, the string zero, it will print it, so it will print string zero, and then it will grab the next one before it does the while check. And so as far as the execution of this goes, it will grab string zero before it enters the while loop, print it, get string one, 
at the end of the first loop and then print it on the second loop, it will grab a string two on the next loop, or sorry, on that same loop, and print it on the next loop, and then it will grab the garbage before it goes up to the top, meaning that this right here will get triggered to be end of file before it tries to do any sort of printing. So notice, now if I move this, if I had this originally here, the order of execution of this code is get line, then the print code. But if I move it to the end here, the execution of this code is get line, then check the condition that your end of file, then print line. And if I do the second loop, it will get line, reach the end of the while loop, come back up here, and check the end of file before the print happens. So if I had it at the beginning, there is no check for end of file between this line of code and this the outline of code. But if I put it at the end, this, because of the way loops work, where it comes back up to the top, has to do the end of file check in between the line of code where it prints and it does the get line. So now, before I try to do any sort of printing of bad stuff, I am going to check to make sure that I actually successfully read before I continued. Finally, let's see this in action really quick, so let's go ahead and run it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and recompile and run it, and there we go, it now works. It prints all of the names from that file in order and with numbers, and so it handles variable length input. So it's a little counterintuitive the way that we have to do this. You do need to read twice, one before a loop, and one at the, out, uh, at the bottom of it. And so the last thing that I'm going to leave this with is just how to do this in Visual Studio. So if you're not using Visual Studio, feel free to go ahead and stop watching now. I just want to go over how you do files if you're doing Visual Studio. Okay, so I'm in Visual Studio. I've copied over that list of names.txt from the server, and I'm going to copy it into my project. So what I'm going to need to do is go over to my project, which is the little purple one up here, it's the box, and I'm going to right click it and hit add. And what I want to do is I, I want to add an existing item. You could also add a new item and use that as your file if you just type in things, but I already have a file that exists, so I'm going to do existing items. You'll see I have a list of names here. Copying it to the directory is not enough. You have to make sure that it's included in your project. So here it's already in the directory, but it's not included in the project. Double click it, and you'll see that it appears in my project now. And so what I have to do is I either need to copy it exactly to where the executable gets loaded, which is going to be probably okay for C++, it may be in the same place that it is now, but just in case, a good idea is to right click on it, and it actually appears down here, I think, um, or in properties, and you'll see that we have item type, text, and content. Um, so content, we want this to be yes, if you're doing another programming language, it'll ask you for what kind of resource this is. I would say you want to go with embedded resource if you're doing something like C Sharp. And what that basically does is whenever you output your, your executable, your actual runnable program, it will copy the file over so that it has access to it. Now if I want to run this program, remember that in Visual Studio we can go to our actual project, so I'll click on it really quick, and then project, and then properties, and then debugging and I can set the command line arguments here. So it should be list of names.txt is the name of the file that we want to read from since I'm doing it as a command line argument rather than just as a hard-coded string. And if I run it now, it should work the same way as on the server. And there we go, and you'll see it runs perfectly fine. It reads from the file and it's able to get it now. So make sure you include it as a resource and set the content equal to yes. And then just make sure if you're doing it as command line argument like I do that you set it that way in Visual Studio. Anyways, I think that about does it for this video, and in the next video, we'll take a look at an introduction to functions.